again. In space, no one can hear you podcast, but we're going to try anyway. Welcome to Film Bookcast, the official podcast of filmbook.com. I'm Mike Smith, and joining me, as always, is a man who will be revealed to be an android halfway through this recording. Mike DeCrecia. How are you doing today, Mike? You know, for an android, I feel pretty good. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> I have lots of emotions about things. Yeah. Trad- traditionally, androids feel pretty bad, so for an android... Yeah, I'm You're doing all right, I guess. Uh, yeah, so if you've never listened to Film Bookcast before, first we start with some film news, then we move on into some discussions where Mike and I each discuss whatever piece of media we've been consuming lately, and it's been a few weeks since we've recorded last, so we have a, a shitload of things. <laughs> yeah, uh, sh- strap in. Yeah, got a, uh, we have a potentially very long episode ahead of us, but uh, that's cool, because we like to talk about things, and that's yeah. why we have a podcast, Mike. That's is that why we do this? That's why I we wasn't, do this. <laughs> oh, okay. I wasn't. I didn't get the memo. <laughs> yeah, our mission statement was not a hundred percent clear, but uh, now, <laughs> now we know. And then after all that, we're going to move on to our featured review. This week, it is the newest film from director Ridley Scott, the sequel to Prometheus, and the sixth overall film in the Alien series. If you don't count the ones where they fight predators, uh, <laughs> it's it's Alien Covenant. Are you excited, Mike? Yeah, yeah, I think there's going to be a lot to talk about for this movie. Absolutely, yeah. We're both big fans of the uh, Alien franchise, so it's uh, it's always cool that there's a new Alien movie out. And it's even cooler that, you know, I was thinking about this uh, this past weekend. I got to see a new Alien movie from Ridley Scott and new Twin Peaks episodes from David Lynch in the same weekend. And I was like, what is happening? What year is it, Mike? <laughs> it is either 1979 or 1991, and I don't care which one it is. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, so very excited to talk about Alien Covenant. Before we get into all that, let's get into some film news. Hi! It's time for... It's time for... It's time for... Film news! Hi! It's time for... It's time for... It's time for... Film news! Film news! All right, it's time to get into some film news, Mike. And like we said before, it's been about three weeks since we recorded our last episode, so there is a lot of stuff to get through. And uh, some of the biggest news that came out this past week. Uh, recently, we reported that Sony is planning a solo Venom movie, a spinoff of their Spider-Man universe. Uh, and now they have an actor to play Venom, and they have a director, too. Tom Hardy is playing Venom in this solo Venom movie, Mike. How nuts is that? Yeah, yeah, that's fucking insane. What a sentence that you just said. <laughs> This is, uh, this is a movie, when we talked about this, I think it was in our last episode, actually. It was either yeah. the last episode or the episode before it. When we talked about it, when they announced this thing, I was like, there's no way this happens. <laughs> yeah, there's not a chance. I will eat my hat before a Venom movie happens by 2018. And I still don't think it can make that date. <laughs> yeah. It's, yeah. it's aiming for October 2018. And it can make that date if it starts very, very soon. Right uh, now. And I think that yeah. is the plan. But even so, I just I feel like it's a very... Very slim window of time. That's like a little over a year, right? That's like 13 months or whatever, like 13, 14 months from now uh, between between now and October 18, 2018. Something like that. Something like sure. that. I don't, I don't know <laughs> math so well, kids. How does math happen? <laughs> uh, I, I did read a, a, a conspiracy on Reddit, I believe, uh, that I think is pretty fun to just imagine is true, that this is a, a hostage situation between Sony and Marvel where they are casting a lead and a hiring a director in an effort to get marvel to buy the rights to venom back also (laughs) like make them think they're gonna make the movie and then have marvel (laughs) i don't think (laughs) which like that's it doesn't really make sense but i'm gonna pretend it's real i mean i i think uh like marvel didn't buy the rights back to spider-man though like sony's like sharing the character with them right well yeah to to include venom in that i think is what they meant yeah i don't i don't think marvel gives a shit about what (laughs) yeah (laughs) <laughs> At this point, about yeah. what any of that does because I mean they like they don't officially have Spider-Man in a solo capacity. They're helping out Sony's solo Spider-Man movies and basically making the movie for them. Um, but, <laughs> but yeah, that's a good point. As far as Marvel's concerned, all they get out of this deal is that they can use Spider-Man in their movies. So, you know, that's right. they can throw him in the Avengers, and it's a cool thing. Uh, and I, I was really honestly like Sony is benefiting so much from this deal, and Mar- oh yeah, and Marvel is getting comparatively very little out of it. I think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, Marvel has to make an extra movie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 
Yeah, I guess that's true. I, I guess they're sharing the rights, right? So in theory, we, we were talking about Venom, how do you make that movie without Spider-Man? But if Sony also has the rights to it, <laughs> they yeah. could include Spider-Man. They could. It's just not uh, yeah, right? whatever. I guess it's like a, a gentleman's agreement as of right now. Uh, right. I really think the Spider-Man connection to the Marvel Universe is very tenuous at best right now. Uh, like we, there was talk about like one of the Sony, it was a while ago, like one of the Sony executives say, was saying like, once the contract is up that, uh, with Tom Holland, like after a Spider-Man homecoming two or whatever, uh, right. they, they might like renegotiate and be like, Oh, we don't want to be in the Marvel universe anymore. And it's like, why would you, why would you even say that now? First of all. And also like, why would you not want to be part of that? Thing? <laughs> yeah. It's, You're going to make a bajillion dollars. What are you doing? Yeah. It's the most successful <laughs> A franchise going on in movies right now, pretty much, except with the possible exception of Fast and the Furious. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, that was just not where I thought that was going to go. Well, it's this true. Point. I mean, it is, I mean, it is true. But uh, who's it, ever thought of that before? The, the only difference is that Marvel comes out with like three times as many movies a year. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, but anyway, I'm getting a little off track there. This Venom movie is going to be directed by Ruben Fleischer, who was the director of Zombieland, which is a movie that I really liked. He also directed Thirty Minutes or Less, which is a movie that I think is okay, and then he directed Gangster Squad, which is a movie that I think is terrible. Uh, <laughs> So. Oh, the, the Neil Blanc, Blanc. Oh man, I can't talk. You know what I'm trying to say. The Chappie guy. The cha- <laughs> I see he's following the Chappie arc. Yeah, the Chappie, the arc of the Chappie. <laughs> it's a- <laughs> yeah, no, it's exactly yeah the Neil Blomkamp thing. He made a really great debut, uh, a really underwhelming second film, and then a, a really. Uh, l- more underwhelming third <laughs> third film, and we I mean actually to be fair I feel like when we watched Chappie we kind of came out saying like oh it was all right like that was, I think we really liked it well, we, not really liked it but I think we liked it when we did the episode yeah we I think we did and we uh, that was back in like episode four or five of this podcast you can go back yeah. and listen to it uh, to hear how wrong we probably were <laughs> about Chappie <laughs> I think we just really wanted it to be good is it yeah. Uh, and I think there is some fun to be had with Chappie. It's a ridiculous movie, but we're going to go off topic again. <laughs> this episode is going to be three hours long. <laughs> so for you listening at home, we normally recorded uh, at like two in the afternoon. Right. Uh, but things, time schedules have shifted. Life happens. Right. So we're recording at 730 at night. Uh, so we're somehow we're loopy as fuck right now. So this <laughs> is <be> fun. <laughs> exactly. We each had long days of work. We're just like fucking around now. Uh, yeah. Anyway. So what were we saying? Tom Hardy is Venom now, which I think, <laughs> which I, which I think is great casting. I think it's a phenomenal choice for the role. Uh, I, I will say, I, if they if they wanted to do the hashtag bring back Topher, wouldn't say no. But yeah, why not at this point? <laughs> but uh, Tom Hardy, no, Tom Hardy's great cast a casting choice for Venom, and he's a guy who I think picks his projects really carefully. Uh, you know, he's he's generally in good stuff. I feel like Tom yeah. Hardy is, and he's he's done his share of like bad stuff too. But it's always interesting bad stuff. Uh, and like I remember, he was like he was cast in Suicide Squad. If you remember, he was like right. I think he was going to play Rick Flag in that movie, uh, and he dropped out. He like left. Rick Flag was Joel Kinnaman's character in uh, in Suicide Squad. If you needed yeah. a reminder, <laughs> I saw. You, well, yeah, I saw your eyes like light up. Like who is that again? Who? I thought it was Captain Boomerang guy. Is that the same dude? Oh, that was like, Jai Courtney. Who I th- maybe it was. Captain I think Boomerang. that's I who know. Tom Hardy was supposed to be. Maybe I, th- I thought he was Rick Flag, but maybe I maybe I'm mistaken. But who knows? Uh, anyway, like, and I, I think Tom Hardy saw that movie for what it was and was like, "Nope, I'm out. I'm out. <laughs> I'm, See you later. I'm, I'm going to go make Mad Max." And that was the best <laughs> choice he possibly could have made. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so uh, anyway, yeah, I think Tom Hardy as Venom is a, a really cool casting choice and probably bodes well for this movie. Ruben Fleischer directing. You know, he did make Zombieland, which is a movie that I like a lot. And I think it's a very well directed, like very stylish movie. So you know, it could there there could be something there with Ruben Fleischer. I I yeah. am eager to see what's happening there. And then also want to throw this out there: the uh, Silver Sable Black Cat movie, which Sony is also making, <laughs> um, which we talked about uh, in the last episode, I think as well. Uh, the Silver Sable and Black Cat are two other side Spider-Man characters uh, who are getting their own movie now, apparently. And this now has a director. Uh, the director is Gina Price Brithwood, uh, who. Directed a movie called The Secret Life of Bees a little while ago. She's mostly done indie films up until this point. Uh, but I think what's significant about this is that this would be the first African-American woman to direct a superhero movie. Uh, yeah. Which is pretty nuts. So that's uh, cool. They're very good on them uh, for Sony. And again, I don't know. I, I, I know it has a director now. The Silver Sable Black Hat movie is not something I ever see hitting theaters at any point. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I, ju- I just feel like those characters are so obscure uh, to mainstream audiences and Sony does not have that Marvel marketing power to uh, to make that a known thing. 
right before that movie yeah. hits. Uh, so I, I don't know if that will happen, but I, I hope it does just for the sake of uh, diversity and all that stuff. I think that, that'd be cool. Yeah, why not? As long as they're making cool movies, like, go yeah. ahead. Hopefully these movies are good. That's all we can say. Exactly. Uh, anyway, that's, that's, that's the thesis for the last 10 minutes of this. <laughs> this. All right, 45 minutes in, we're through one piece of film news. <laughs> uh, so let's get to the next thing. Uh, the Uncharted movie, which we've talked about in the past. We're both big fans of the Uncharted games. Uh, oh, yeah. the, uh, there was this Uncharted movie has been in the works for so long, Mike. I feel like I, I think it's been a, since around like Uncharted Two, the video game came out in two thousand nine. I would say so, yeah. Yeah, because I remember around then they were talking about like, David O. Russell being involved. Like he was he was attached to direct this thing with like Robert De Niro and Joe Pesci, and it was like what? Like what is <laughs> what is even happening? Mark Wahlberg <laughs> was going to play Nathan Drake, and it's like well, this yep. is not going to be an Uncharted movie. It might be a cool movie, but it won't be Uncharted. <laughs> Right. Uh, but then, you know, th- there's been so many different, like, changes in the director and changes in the screenwriters. Uh, and so recently it was announced that uh, they cast Nathan Drake. They finally cast Nathan Drake. And it is not one that uh, anybody expected. It's Tom Holland who's playing Spider Man. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, who is like 19 years old, something like that, right? He's a kid. He's Spider-Man. Yeah, 20 something, I think. Yeah. Uh, he's, he's very young. Uh, and apparently this Uncharted movie is being reworked again so that it's a prequel that takes place before the games. So I guess in this realm, the games are still going to be considered canon and it's going to be taking place like years before where it's like kid Drake. I think it's going to, um, it, it's going to take its cues from the flashbacks of like Uncharted three and Uncharted four. Where you see right. like Kid Drake. I think it's going to be like him meeting up with Sully and all that stuff. So we've already seen some of that stuff in the games. But I think there is like room for kind of like crazy adventures. You know, they always like allude to like, oh, remember this time we did that or whatever. And <laughs> Right. Yeah, I think one of the things we always talked about, too, when we talk about a, uh, an Uncharted movie, is that the games are so cinematic that an Uncharted movie of that story, like of one of the games, is just the game. Right. Yes. <laughs> so I think that is a smart idea as far as, you know, the Uncharted franchise and a movie would go to set it in a, you know, not just remake one of the games, I guess. Right. Uh, to use a different story, set it in a different time period. Uh, I like that idea. I think young Nathan Drake is a really cool, like those flashback sequences in Uncharted 4 are fun and really interesting for sure. his character, like, you know, to show where he comes from and stuff. So why not? The fucking make Tom Holland the next biggest actor at this point. <laughs> he's gonna be like, go yeah, ahead. He's, he's Spider Man now. I mean, it's nuts. I mean, that, what's great about him being Spider Man is that he already has experience going like, whoa, 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 <laughs> <laughs> and just falling and swinging everywhere. Yeah, yeah. which will be the half of Nathan Drake's uh, actions in the movie, I'm sure. <laughs> and just sarcastic one liners. Yeah. yeah, he's got it. He's That's, got he's, it down. He's already got it. So uh, there's that. And but uh, what's what is disconcerting to me about this is that uh, Joe Carnahan was writing the script for Uncharted, and Joe Carnahan guy who I really love, you know, he's directed The Grey and he directed Stretch and Narc and a whole bunch of cool stuff and he was writing the script for this movie. He wasn't directing, but he was writing it uh, and that script has been thrown out now which is uh, kind of unfortunate. But no. In any case, uh, Sean Levy is still attached to direct who uh, directed the Night at the Museum movies. He directed uh, Real Steel uh, and you know, he's, he's, he's uh, a very like solid workmanlike director. I don't dislike Sean Levy. I don't particularly love any of his movies, but I don't, <laughs> he'll make a nice family adventure movie. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I, I am hopeful for the uncharted movie if it ever happens. Uh, cause again, it's been like 10 years in the making at this point. <laughs> yeah. It'll be a double feature with the silver. With, Sable, the, with the black cat. Black cat. Movie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Whose names you said five minutes ago and I already forgot them. <laughs> <laughs> so Sony really has its work cut out for them there. Yeah, it's going to be hard. <laughs> uh, and then uh, I do have the next thing. Tom Cruise, Mike, uh, the star of The Mummy itself, is... Uh, <laughs> it's just... You take that back. <laughs> the only Mummy movie ever made, star oh. Tom Cruise, uh, says that uh, Top Gun 2 is apparently happening. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Why not? We got to remake every '80s movie ever. So it's, it's all happening. It's it's nostalgia, man. I mean, I think uh, what's been what's weird about this is that Top Gun Two was kind of in the works for a while, like a while ago. I think this was also back in like 2010. Uh, Tom Cruise was talking about doing a Top Gun Two, uh, and Tony Scott, who directed the original Top Gun, uh, was set to direct Top Gun Two, and then he died. I think in 2010 is when that happened. Uh, and so Top Gun Two was kind of put on the back burner. Uh, for a long time, and I just haven't heard anything about it for a really long time. I remember it was, I think it was a couple years ago, they re released Top Gun in 3D. Uh, that sounds familiar. I'm pretty yeah. sure that happened. There was a period of time where they were just re releasing all the movies in 3D. There's, yeah. <laughs> uh, but they did that. I'm pretty sure they did Top Gun at some point, and so that might have been like a litmus test for how how people might have been excited for 
like uh, f- how the appetite for Top Gun might be in the world. Like, who knows? Right. Uh, anyway, so Tom Cruise is saying it's happening. Val Kilmer is saying he would like to come back as Iceman. Uh, so that would be something. Uh, <laughs> sure. I mean, why not at this point? Yeah, like, what else is Val Kilmer up to, you know? Like, why, <laughs> why not? Uh <laughs> Savage. Not to throw Val Kilmer under the bus. I, look, hey, to be fair, Val Kilmer has, has been in two of my favorite movies of the 21st century, which were Kiss Kiss Bang Bang and MacGruber. So, <laughs> <laughs> hey, so there's that. Uh, and uh, it's looking like uh, Joseph Kaczynski may direct this movie too. And Joseph Kaczynski uh, directed Tom Cruise once before in the movie Oblivion, uh, and he also directed Tron Legacy. And uh, what's I, I never saw Tron Legacy, but I saw Oblivion. Because uh, I really love Tom Cruise, and I'll basically watch him do anything. Uh, yeah. Oblivion is really bad. <laughs> it's, I don't, have you seen Oblivion? I have. I remember liking it, but I don't remember yeah. anything. I don't remember why or, I, like, anything about it. So. I, I remember being so bored, but, like, so visually enthralled. I think that movie, like, visually yeah, is kind of insane. I think that that was probably it, yeah. Uh, like, vi- visually, it's really incredible. And from what I've heard about Tron Legacy, it's the same deal there. Uh, but yeah. I, I just remember Oblivion ripping off every single sci-fi movie that's ever existed. Uh, yeah, and I think yeah. Was, now I, that I'm now that I'm remembering the twist, yeah, <laughs> yep. yeah. Okay, I, I I remember think I I remember thinking that might have been intentional. Like it seemed like an homage to like all science fiction. Uh, oh yeah. There's like the twist that's uh, very reminiscent of Moon, uh, and right. there's uh, homages to like to, to this one Space Odyssey, and there's a Planet of the Apes thing where you see the Statue of Liberty in the rubble or whatever. Uh, yeah. And there's like a Star Wars trench run at one point and it's like it's it's literally all the sci-fi in one. And that seems like something I should I should fucking love. But I just right. <laughs> I just remember thinking it was a very boring uh and very like repetitive and very uh dull movie. And so I don't know about Joe Kosinski directing Top Gun 2, but it'll probably look really nice at least, uh if that's the case. <laughs> so it's got that going for it. Um but I guess this would probably focus on like more uh, like they talked about Top Gun 2 in the past and what it would be, and it sounds like it would be more modernized and like drone, uh, having to do with drone warfare rather than like fighter pilots and stuff like that. So, right, there could be uh, an, in- an interesting angle to take with Top Gun 2. I don't think it will probably take that angle. It's a Top Gun movie, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's going to be mo- mostly like cheesiness and uh, shirtless volleyball scenes, and that's like, yeah, uh... <laughs> it's it's 80 minutes of volleyball and 10 minutes of fighter things i mean you got to give people what they want is yeah <laughs> uh so that is apparently a thing that's happening top gun too so throwing that out there uh and then i have a, a lot of really sad news to report now coming down the pike uh a lot of my favorite celebrities died over the past few weeks uh which is uh very upsetting very disappointing and so i'll go i'm gonna go through uh the list of them here uh well i'll <laughs> What a ter- that's such a terrible way that you have to put that. No, I mean, I okay. What I'm going to do, I'm going to I'm going to name one, and then I'm just going to mention a few of their stuff. That's it that they're in. If you have like a favorite performance of theirs, you can throw that throw that out there, Mike. Sure. All right. So the first one is Michael Parks, uh, who's one I, one of my favorite character actors. He was huge in Quentin Tarantino movies and uh, Robert Rodriguez movies, uh, Kevin Smith movies. Uh, he's in a lot of stuff. He was uh, probably most well known. Uh, to film geeks, as Sheriff Earl McGraw in a couple of different uh, Tarantino and Rodriguez movies. I think he plays that in right. both Kill Bills uh, and uh, Death Proof. I think. I think. I think Death Proof and Planet Terror. He plays that role. Yeah. Uh, and he's in. Uh, I think he's in From Dusk Till Dawn. I think playing that same role. And he's he's in a, he's in a bunch of that stuff. And uh, he's also uh, Jean Renault on uh, Twin Peaks. Uh, yeah, that's that's probably my favorite, just because. Yeah. And he's it's Twin Peaks. Yeah, exactly. I mean, yeah, Twin Peaks is awesome, and he was great on that show. Uh, and he was also, I mean, in Kill Bill Volume Two, he he played two roles. He played uh, Earl, Earl McGraw in the beginning, and then he played uh, what was it, Esteban Viejo, the uh, the Spanish guy at the end, uh, who like who, who knows Bill and like is able to lead the bride to Bill. And right. it's, like I think that's kind of it's, it's so remarkable to me that he was both of those characters because he is unrecognizable as Esteban Viejo and he does like such an incredibly different performance. Uh, like I did, I did not know it was him. Uh, like I knew was, he was Sheriff McGraw the first time I saw the movie. Right. Uh, and then I, I did not know it was him until like, a couple of times seeing Kill Bill that I was like, Oh my God, that's, that's also <laughs> Michael Parks. That's insane. <laughs> that is insane. Um, yeah. but in recent years he became, he became a little bit more well known uh, for being in Kevin Smith movies. He was in red. He, Kevin Smith famously like made movies, that were built around Michael Parks performances. Like he just wanted to make me like, that was most of the reason that red state exists was, <laughs> was because Michael was, he wanted Michael Parks to do like a 15 minute monologue. Um, being really, have you, have you seen red state? There's literally like, I have not. Okay. I know. I know. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm not the biggest fan of late, late, late period Kevin Smith, but I do like red state quite a bit or, or I did back in the day. And there's like a 10 minute 
long scene of them in a church and it's Michael Parks as the preacher just monologuing and it's menacing and it's cool and it's very awesome. And then Michael Parks was also uh, the bad guy in Tusk uh, as well. Right. And he is, he single-handedly makes Tusk worth watching. Is <laughs> Wow. Uh, other than like the weirdness of watching Tusk. And it's like, I Tusk, Tusk is an odd movie. Uh, but yeah, so Michael Parks, very upset about that one. And then another one of my favorite character actors died uh, over the past few weeks. And that is Powers Booth. Uh, who uh, was in Deadwood. He was pretty well known for being in Deadwood as Cy Tolliver. Uh, he was in Sin City as a Senator O'Rourke. Uh, and of course, is my favorite of his roles, uh, MacGruber. <laughs> <laughs> this is a very MacGruber heavy podcast. Oh, uh, when is it not? But he, he plays Colonel Faith in MacGruber, uh, MacGruber's uh, commanding officer. And, and he's the straight man in that movie, but he is a, he's just so good at it. And he's, he's perfect at it. And he has this very like commanding, voice that was really uh, intense uh, and great. And he was also uh, in the Avengers briefly. He played one of the World Security Council um, that Nick Fury like, reports to. And then he reprised that role on Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. And it was the bad, like kind of the big bad for the third season of that show. Uh, and so that was very cool to see him on that show too. And, uh, you know, that was very upsetting. Do you, uh, I mean, do you know, have a favorite Powers Booth performance, Mike? Uh, you know, I don't think I do off the top of my head. Okay. I, I know he's one of those guys that's in everything. Yeah, exactly. Like, and I just, I can't place yeah, anyone. He's, some, he's somebody that you notice as soon as he's, uh, exactly. He was yeah. In, I think he was, in, he was in Tombstone also. Oh, big role there. Yeah. Okay. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's Tombstone, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> there <it is. laughs> yeah, there it is. Uh, so yeah, there's Powers Booth. And then uh, I did want to mention this. This isn't uh, specifically a film-related one, but this one uh, was cut pretty deep. was uh, Chris Cornell, uh, lead singer of Soundgarden, Audio Slave, and Temple of the Dog. Huge, it's hugely influential 90s musician uh, yeah. died. And like, I, I, like, I'm a pretty huge Soundgarden fan, pretty huge alternative rock fan. And so that was a huge blow. Um, but also I wanted to mention him because he did the theme song for Casino Royale, the first Daniel Craig James Bond movie. Uh, and I think it's one of the best James Bond themes. Like it's, it is a really, oh, yeah. really strong one. That's called, you know, my name, if you want to look that up, but that's a really strong theme song and really like, it just kicks off that era of James Bond in a really good way. I think. Yeah. Yeah. Audio Slave was one of the first bands for me that like, in you know eighth or ninth grade like getting in finally figuring out like what kind of music i like yeah as like an individual uh and audio slave was one of those first bands that i found that i was like this is the this is what rock and roll is supposed to be like <laughs> you know yeah. uh yeah so chris cardell was definitely a huge influence on me yeah absolutely so i wanted to mention him uh and then also uh lisa spoonhour who played caitlin brie in clerks uh which is one of my favorite movies of all time again like i'm a huge fan of early period kevin smith not as much late period Kevin Smith, but Clerks, hugely formative movie for me. And uh, like Lisa Spoonhauer, who played Caitlin Bree, uh, Dante's ex-girlfriend, who comes back at the end and fucks a dead guy. Uh, that's <laughs> <laughs> Only in a Kevin Smith movie Only would you be Kevin able to Smith. say that. <laughs> uh, like, I, just, like, I feel like uh, a lot of the credit for that movie goes to Dante and Randall and Jane Silent Bob. Like, those are the people who people tend to remember. But I feel like Lisa Spoonhauer as Caitlin and also um, Marilyn, Marilyn Gigliotti as... Uh, uh, the other girlfriend, I'm blanking on her name right now. Uh, they like they never get enough credit for being as good as they are in in that movie. I feel like everybody in the movie is really uh, firing on all cylinders, and it's just really I, I like you know listening to the dialogue of that movie. Like there is a lot of like really intricate dialogue that is done in very one in like one take. Like it's, yeah, <laughs> like you can see like there's just no cutting, and the camera will just sit still for ten minutes and let these people talk. Uh, and I love Clerks. It's it's it is a rough, like. It, it, that was a very formative movie for me, and I think it's kind of if I if I watch it for the first time now, I might not like it as much. You know, it's just because like that's such a it's a, it's a, such a, it's such an amateurish movie almost. Like it feels like yeah, you know, it's but it's it's so I think raw in a way. <laughs> like, yeah, it's very much I think about young adulthood, right? Like yeah, or or it speaks to that 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 viewer so much more than I think it does to a fully formed. <laughs> <laughs> "Quote unquote mature adult, right? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And uh, and again, Lisa Spoonhauer is uh, great in that movie. And Kevin Smith wrote up a really uh, long uh, post about her on uh, his Instagram, I think, and his Facebook. And so that was uh, really nice to see. And then, of course, uh, this is the big one: uh, Roger Moore, the uh, iconic James Bond actor, uh, died at like eighty nine. I think he was. Uh, yeah, so he I was think very, so. He was very old. I think he's older than Sean Connery, or like just almost as old as Sean Connery. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't remember, but uh, he is the he is the first James Bond to die. That's the first the first one. Which wow, is, yeah, which is insane. Uh, and Roger Moore was never like my favorite Bond, but in, in a lot of his movies, like he he's he is James Bond. That's the thing. I feel like you know with Sean Connery, he was James Bond, but he also went on to other things. 
Uh, right. And he's also recognizable in several other roles. Uh, so it's like he's Sean Connery. Uh, he's not James Bond. Roger Moore is James Bond because I feel like his he, he was James Bond for the longest for right. uh, that. I think it's like seven movies over like 12 years, something like that. Um, but also like he wasn't really in a ton of stuff after Bond. And so I feel like he is so like ingrained with that character. And uh, The Spy Who Loved Me is like all time James Bond. That's one of my favorite Bond movies. Um, so that was uh, very upsetting to hear that. And of course, it's like Live and Let Die and The Man with the yeah. Gun and Moonraker. Yeah, I think it's it's so funny, like what, the, you know, the, the different kinds of Bond, right? You know, Sean Connery is like the this, this sexy suave. Right. And <laughs> Roger Moore's era is just so silly oh, and yeah. hilarious. Like that's ridiculous. the best part of all those movies. And it's yeah. so much fun. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, so RIP to all those people. That was a yeah. <laughs> long, uh, very upsetting few weeks. Uh, and then I did want to ha- – I, I do have more sad news, uh, unfortunately. <laughs> um, so uh, Zack Snyder uh, has stepped down uh, from his Justice League duties after a family tragedy. His daughter actually committed suicide. Uh, yeah. And so that is insane. Not, not news that I had ever expected to see. Uh, and I guess it happened back in March – uh, and he's yeah. stepping down now. I guess he like once it happened, like he took some like there was like a two week break in filming so he can uh, grieve and mourn with his family and stuff. And then uh, from there, he like dived right back into filming uh, to take his mind off things. And like uh, he was working with the studio and the studio was like apparently very accommodating with him. They were like, we can move the release date. We can delay things and all that. Like they seemed very understanding about it, uh, which is good. Um, but, he, you know, at this point, uh, Zack Snyder, uh, I guess the movie is basically filmed at this point. Like, yeah, it's, it's pretty much shot. Uh, and so it's mostly post-production at this point that still has to do and maybe like the filming of some additional scenes. Uh, so Zack Snyder is stepping down from just the duties for the remainder of the, uh, movie making process. Also Deborah Snyder, his wife is also taking time off. She was a producer on the movie. Uh, and Joss Whedon is filling in actually, which is uh, kind of insane. Uh, yeah. and he's seeing the project to completion, which is, uh, I, like I said, mostly post-production at this point with some additional scenes to be shot. I guess, uh, Whedon was already going to like write in a couple of extra scenes for the justice league, like before all this happened. Uh, oh, okay. So he was already kind of involved. Cause we mentioned before Josh Whedon is attached to direct Batgirl, uh, from right. DC. And so I guess he's part of that. Uh, uh, you know, he's part of the DC family. Now he switched sides <laughs> from Marvel to DC. Uh, but so it's kind of, it's kind of insane that Josh Whedon is going to be finishing up this. Uh, but if it, like, that's like, Beautiful, beautiful hands, and like we we talk we talk about Zack Snyder a lot on this show. <laughs> we, yeah, yeah. We, this one hits real close to the show. This yeah. one hits home. <laughs> uh, you know, and we uh, have pretty strong feelings about some of uh, Zack Snyder's DC movies, but uh, you know, no one should have to go through this, and it's yeah. really shitty. And you know, I I love Joss Whedon, so I think if this is any if this is in anybody's hands, that's I'm, I'm glad that it's in his. Uh, and you know, I, I think this will still mostly be Zack Snyder's movie. Um, yeah, I think this is Whedon uh, helping a friend out. Maybe I don't know. You know, he's, he's gonna. It's just post production and a few reshoots or extra scenes or yeah. scenes or something. So like a couple of additional scenes. So we'll see. Right. How, we'll see how this all shakes out for Justice League. I think the movie will be mostly uh, unaffected by all this. Uh, yeah, you know, we'll see what happens. I, I, like I, I mean, what what are the odds that Justice League is a good movie? Like, what do you what do you think? <sighs> Man, uh, don't put don't ask me that after this story. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. I, I'm. I mean, after the success, hopefully, uh, fingers crossed, of Wonder Woman. Yeah, maybe. I, th- I think there there has been a, a, a huge turnaround in what DC has been doing over the past uh, few months. Uh, yeah. You know, Wonder, Wonder Woman has been getting uh, very positive early reactions, uh, and it sounds like Justice League. Uh, they've shifted the tone of that movie a lot, and like they've changed. They've listened to the response that Batman for Superman got, uh, and it sounds like you know they're really trying to make something really good. Yeah, I th- I think that's the the key, right? If they actually listened to, and to heeded the 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 backlash of against everything being so dark, uh, and you know the the Snyderverse that we joke about all the time, which right. we may have to retire out of respect for a little while. Yeah, we'll probably keep that joke down to a minimum for the time being. Yeah. Uh, so was, I think I think they you know they always have the potential to be really good and refreshing. So hopefully hopefully it is. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So that uh, that wraps up film news. We had a lot of sad stuff to report uh, towards <laughs> towards the end there. Uh, not everything can be as fun as talking about Top Gun two. For <laughs> man, but I have ten more minutes on whatever our first topic was. Venom. I don't even remember anymore. <laughs> it was so long ago. My beard has grown two inches since then. <laughs> um, but yeah. So we should get out of film news, Mike. Let's move on into our discussions. Watch this. Venom. 
things on my discussion. But just when I thought I said all I could say, my body and I talk about movies and scenes on my discussion. There is so much to see, you and me. So we're going to talk about movies for our discussions. All right, it's time to get into our discussions on Film Bookcast. Mike, what do you have to discuss with us today? Uh, so I have two things. Well, I guess technically seven things but uh, <laughs> to talk about, but six of them are all one thing. Yeah. It's going to make sense, I promise. Sure, why not? Uh, the first thing, real quick, uh, fuck you, Tom Cruise, is the mummy. Uh, the real <laughs> mummy is <laughs> Brendan starring uh, Brendan Fraser, the mummy. I mean, okay, the real mummy is, you know, the okay. 1930s Look, Boris Karloff. I'm just... right, don't don't split hairs here, Mike. <laughs> okay. uh, yeah, my friends and I, a few of us, were talking about uh, the upcoming The Mummy with Tom Cruise that we talked about and how I think, I don't know, originally that they looked awful in that first trailer I saw, but now I might be turning around on it. But uh, I wanted to throw it back and rewatch the 1999 The Mummy starring Brendan Fraser because I remember seeing that in theaters and being terrified and having so much fun. Um, and I rewatched it, and it, it, it holds up. It's silly, fun, adventure, bombastic silliness. Yeah. And it's Brendan Fraser at his peak, so like, what's not to like? Yeah, there was a, there was a short-lived time where Brendan Fraser was a huge movie star. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, he's actually got a very tragic story. <laughs> As, I mean, I, I really don't know his backstory or anything. I know yeah, he's... I remember reading about uh, he suffered some kind of back injury that prevented him from being able to be in action movies anymore. Really? Uh, and was just never cast in movies again. And then his wife divorced him and took all his money. Oh, <laughs> uh, man. Ouch. Yeah. <laughs> so, tragic twist that's, to that's, Ben Fraser's that's, story. That's upsetting. I... Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, I know he's on, uh, he has like, a recurring role on The Affair, I think, on Showtime. I think he's on that show. Yeah. Uh, so, he's, he's, yeah. he's, 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 I think he's, I think the Fraser Assange uh, <laughs> could be, could be coming back. You know? The, yeah. Why not? What's Bre- one more actor? <laughs> the Brendan Assange. Is... <laughs> Oh, my God. Uh, so then the other six things I wanted to talk about yeah. uh, was a joint adventure, Mike. We went on an adventure last week. We I don't know did. if you remember. I recall. <laughs> <laughs> we went to the Hudson Horror Show, which was a six-movie, 12-hour marathon uh, in a shitty $2 movie theater. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and it was wonderful. It was uh, six ridiculous B cheesy horror movies yes uh, well not all of them were horror i guess yeah and not all of them were cheesy and like you know yeah there was just a lot of schlock fun funness yeah, exactly. i guess yeah it was, a, it was uh, a good mix of a lot of different stuff yeah uh the first movie we watched was frankenhooker which uh tells you everything you need to know uh, <laughs> it's all about right that movie title. yeah <laughs> yeah yeah uh and then the next movie we watched was slaughterhouse was just this weird 80s late 80s slasher movie about these guys protecting their slaughterhouse that the bank was coming to take. Yep. Uh, <laughs> we watched a mystery movie, which, uh, as per our uh, binding contracts with the Hudson Horror Show, uh, we're not allowed to discuss. Yes, that's true. That's uh, exaggerated, but we're not allowed to talk about it. We're not allowed to say what it is. We can say that it was good, I think, is the... Uh... Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We're not allowed to say the title, right? Uh, yeah, I, I think this might have been my favorite movie out of the whole marathon. Um, it was something that I was never expecting, and it yeah. was fucking awesome. Yeah, so there you go. It's a shame that we can't actually say what it is, so people... Uh... Yeah. <laughs> but if you see what Mike on the street and you want to know what movie it was, he'll tell you. Yeah, let me know or shoot me a Twitter DM or something, maybe. <laughs> I don't know, they didn't specify. <laughs> yeah, as long as it's not made public. Exactly. Uh, the next movie we watched was Nightmare on Elm Street 3 Dream Warriors. Uh, I am not particularly uh, well-versed in the Nightmare on Elm Street franchise, but I've heard this is the best one, uh, and it was really cool. <laughs> the best sequel, let's say, because the, well, yeah. the original is the best one. Yeah. Out of the 19,000 sequels, right. this is the, best one. <laughs> this is the yeah. best one. I mean, this one was written by uh, Wes Craven as a story credit on this one. Uh, right. And also Frank Darabont uh, wrote this one. Also, he directed Shawshank Redemption yeah. uh, and The Mist and created The Walking Dead. He's a pretty big, pretty big Yeah, guy. and it was really cool. Uh, it was, is this like one of Patricia Arquette's first movies, maybe? I don't know. I she so, looked yeah. really young. Patricia yeah. Arquette is the lead of this movie, yeah. And also Lawrence Fishburne uh, is in Dream Warriors. Yeah, as cool. ca- credited as Larry Fishburne. Uh, <laughs> Which was awesome. Uh, the next movie we watched was The Hidden, starring uh, Kyle MacLachlan in some late 80s sci-fi, pre-Twin Peaks, pre-X-Files, yeah. alien cop drama. Yeah, uh, I, this, this was my favorite one of the, uh, of the festival. I, I like yeah, yeah, it's a toss-up between The Hidden, probably The Hidden first for me, too, and then the mystery movie. Uh, and then the last movie we watched was uh, Piranha, 
the 19, yeah. I don't even know this movie came out. 1978, directed by Joe Dante, my man. I... Friend, of the, friend of the show, Joe Dante. <laughs> <laughs> he retweeted me on Twitter once. Was, there you go. Yeah, That's we, enough. We, we've communicated, actually, because I, <laughs> I was talking about his movie Matinee, and he responded back, and I was like, yes. That's uh, awesome. Yeah, I'm a big Joe Dante fan. I had never seen Piranha. Uh, and I had I had seeked it out. I had looked for Piranha in the past, and I had never been able to find it. Um, you know, it's well. Good news for you, Mike. Yeah, I you you won a DVD. <laughs> <laughs> I, I did. I won a DVD of Joe Dante's Piranha because I am the only person who knows everything about the Piranha 3D remake. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty ridiculous. That's the kind of thing we were at, listeners. Uh, <laughs> That Mike won a DVD of the original Piranha for his Piranha 3D trivia knowledge. Uh, <laughs> of which I have a lot. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, but Piranha is just a silly Jaws ripoff spoof thing. And it was way funnier than I was ever expecting for what I had heard about this movie. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, it was a good time. 13 hours or 12 hours or whatever of silly, uh, intense, awesome movies yeah it was a long time and i've done a couple of these marathon things in the past we, i did the uh, the rocky marathon at the draft house and i did the schwarzenegger marathon at the draft house uh and this was the first time the, my first non-draft house marathon and i i really enjoyed being there but after a while you feel it like you feel that uh, yeah. you've been there for 13 hours whereas at yeah. the draft house you get the comfortable seats you got the food coming in every, all the time and it's like i feel like in this one it was like a fight for survival almost <laughs> we went through something we went through something we sat there among a bunch of freaks <laughs> <laughs> yeah, surviving on popcorn for yeah. eight of those twelve hours. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because we we didn't realize that we were able to bring our own food. <laughs> yeah, rookie mistake. A rookie mistake. So, uh, <laughs> like after the first movie, we like bolted to fucking Wendy's and came back, and then it's like, all right, now we have to subsist on popcorn nachos for the rest of the day. Uh, yeah, and that's I think we did we, all right. Yeah, we did. We did fine. We did fine. Uh, so that was the Hudson Horror Show and the Mummy, and then I have a few things I want to talk about, and the first of which uh, you've also watched at least some of mike uh twin peaks is back man yeah <laughs> i'm i'm so excited yeah it's finally here uh the first four episodes of what could potentially be one of the best things i've ever seen <laughs> but like maybe not but maybe like it's uh I, I i mean holy shit dude uh yeah. so you've seen the first two episodes i've seen the first four uh yes. you gotta watch episodes three and four as soon as you can um but yeah it is it is unreal just how all in the show goes, you know, it is, oh, yeah. it is insane. Uh, you know, we, we've both talked a lot in the past about how big fans we are of Twin Peaks. Uh, I believe I chronicled, uh, I, I didn't really chronicle my entire watch through of Twin Peaks, but I've mentioned the fact that I was watching it a lot uh, as I was right. watching it and where I was and stuff. Uh, so my my fandom of Twin Peaks has been chronicled on this show uh, quite quite a lot in the past. And I, I went you know, all in on Twin Peaks. I bought like the books and I got into like all this other stuff. Uh, so I was very excited about this uh, new return. Also, very like not just that it was Twin Peaks returning, the fact that David Lynch is writing and directing every single episode, and it's eighteen episodes, which is a lot for. <laughs> for... Wait, it's, I didn't know it was eighteen episodes. I thought it was ten or something. Oh, oh my no, god, it is eighteen episodes, sir. Uh, and David Lynch is uh, directing and co-writing every single one, along with Mark Frost, the other guy who uh, co-created Twin Peaks. And, uh, dude, uh, this, this show has gone all in. It is uncompromising. It is intense. I often do not know what I'm watching. Um, yeah. but I love every second of it and it fucking terrifies me. Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I was so unsettled by, uh, a lot of the stuff in Twin Peaks, uh, this new season in, in a way that like I would get unsettled by watching the original stuff, but like, I, I feel like there's a difference in the way, in the unsettling nature of it, because that was a network TV show. Uh, right. and this is cable and it just, it has, it has so much more freedom and it literally is showtime just giving David Lynch a bunch of money to make whatever he wanted. Uh, yeah. and it's, it's kind of insane. And also David Lynch has not directed anything in about in more than 10 years. Inland Empire was his last movie in 2006. Uh, and he hasn't directed any kind of narrative feature or TV show or anything since then. Uh, the closest thing to it, he directed, uh, <laughs> He directed a Duran Duran concert uh, back in like 2011 because, of course, like, he did. yeah, naturally. <laughs> but I, I I think it's it's you know I, I'm thinking back to when I when we did the leftovers mid season check in, and I remember one of the things I talked about was when it's one of the few shows on TV that doesn't care if the audience is coming along with it, right? Like yeah. what it's just going to do what it's going to do. Yeah. Uh, and this this is David Lynch going to 11. Twin like, Peaks <laughs> makes the leftovers look like blue bloods. Like it's. <laughs> <laughs> it's, yeah, 
<laughs> it's the Big Bang Theory compared to this. Like it's it's it's, it's David Lynch giving the double bird to everyone, but like not in a not a, not in a fuck you kind of way. It's like a fuck you, join me, won't you? Yeah, like it's like this is how it's done, kind of way. Yeah, it's, yeah. Because that's the thing. Twin Peaks like was such an iconic show uh, when it first hit, and it was such an influential show. Like every TV show since Twin Peaks has some kind of debt to pay to Twin Peaks, you know? Like the, oh, left, yeah. the Leftover is this hugely influenced by Twin Peaks. I, if, even in the, um, it, in the trailers for Twin Peaks before the new season started, I would see, like, you know, promos for him. And Damon Lindelof was in them, talking about, like, yeah. how, how big Twin Peaks was for him. Uh, and also, like, the guy who made Ray Donovan is in them, because it's a Showtime show. <laughs> it's uh, a but, Showtime show. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, it, there's, like, and, and what's kind of crazy about these, uh, these episodes is that they... It, like it almost echoes a lot of the shows that have come after Twin Peaks. I feel like there's the kind of two sense of the leftovers has. There's part of it that takes place in South Dakota, and, and it, there's like a, a prolonged comedy bit that would feel right at or like right in place with Fargo. You know? Yeah, uh, it it definitely feels a lot like David Lynch being like, "Yes, welcome, like come home, my children." Yeah. Like <laughs> <laughs> it's pre- it's it's so it's definitely like you said. Uh, uh, most of the time in those first two episodes, I had no idea what the fuck I'm watching. Um, I also think it's interesting that they're, I mean, it might be a semantics thing, but like they're calling them parts, right? Uh, yes. Instead of, instead of episodes. And I definitely, from those first two parts, get the feeling that David Lynch just made an 18 hour movie. I think that's, that's uh, what he said. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Amazing. It's so good. Yeah. Uh, and it's nuts. And I feel like a lot of times that like, like uh, the showrunners will say like, Oh, we actually envisioned this as like a 13 hour movie or whatever. Uh, and a lot of times I hate that because I feel like TV is like an episodic medium. And so you need to kind of build like an episode. It needs to have some kind of importance, but I feel like David Lynch's thing. Uh, like I'm all in on whatever he does, you know? Right. Um, but I, I feel like every episode does feel like its own thing. Uh, and, but while also serving this larger purpose, but at the same time, yes, it does feel like a gigantic 18 hour movie and I am loving it so much. The end of episode two <laughs> Uh, and the first half hour of episode three is some of the most insane shit I've ever seen in my entire life. It is, it is balls to the wall, bananas. And yeah. then, and then it veers into comedy so quickly and so easily. And it's just so great, man. I mean, especially <laughs> episode uh, the second half of episode three and episode four are really funny. Uh, and they're That's amazing. really funny. in like that very uncomfortable David Lynch way where it's like, I don't know why this is funny. I don't know how this is funny. I don't know if this is funny, but like, but I'm laughing, <laughs> but I'm laughing. There's a, I mean, I can't, I really want to talk to you about this. I don't know if you have seen anything about episodes three and four. Um, but there is an actor who shows up in episode four, uh, who has this very long extended comedy bit. It goes on okay. for like eight minutes. And it's the best thing I've ever seen. It's become very divisive. A lot of people really hate it. Uh, okay. That makes me love it more. I, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, I mean, that's the thing. Like, I, I I am so interested to just dissect and have my mind blown every time I think about these things. Like, I, I can't even tell you what happens exactly at the end of episode two. Like, I don't even I, – I don't think I was able to process it, like, what I was watching. <laughs> I don't even yeah. remember. I mean, I'm planning on oh. rewatching all the episodes uh, before episode five. <laughs> before episode five airs, I gotta, I gotta so carve that out, should give you a hint. I gotta carve out four hours of my time to <laughs> to rewatch them, uh, and I'm glad to do it. I am so all in on this. I like I, this is blowing me away in a way that like even I couldn't have predicted. Uh, and I feel like da- David Lynch is is really like onto something here. Like this could be like his magnum opus. Uh, it feels like that it is yeah like this, this feels like real event television which is the, like yeah. the, of, of the sort that doesn't get made that much anymore uh, and so I'm just very excited for the rest of the season and I think uh, I'm, I might use this discussions segment of our podcast to just talk about Twin Peaks for the for the entire it, summer it'll be our mini Twin Peaks podcast that yeah. we had always talked about we had talked about doing a Twin Peaks podcast and then we decided no that's too much work um, yeah. but we already can't handle the two that we have right now <laughs> yeah so it, it has been three weeks since our last podcast. So. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. So yeah, that was never that was a pipe dream at best. But we can we can, <laughs> we can set aside ten minutes an episode to talk about Twin Peaks, and I think that's fine. <laughs> "Quote unquote" ten minutes. <laughs> yeah, we'll long? set aside a Marvel ten minutes. <laughs> the gentleman's hour and a half. Uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, so I did want to talk about Twin Peaks, and that is a uh, really incredible. And then I also wanted to briefly mention uh, that I rewatched the entire Alien franchise, leading up to leading up to uh, Alien Covenant. Uh, and you know, I've, we've, we like, you know, alien and aliens are awesome, right? We yeah. are all, all, always big fans of alien and aliens. And then from there, I feel like everybody hates the rest of the alien. 
<laughs> the rest of the other franchise, <laughs> right? Doesn't it see? It feels like that. Like everybody's like the it, first two movies are very good, and then the rest of it sucks. Yeah. Uh, and I gotta say, I rewatched the entire franchise, and there is some bad stuff. That uh, I will say, I did not watch uh, the Alien vs Predator movies. I did not. I did not rewatch those uh, because I'm not gonna put myself through that. Um, yeah. But <laughs> but I rewatched uh, Alien and Aliens, and then I rewatched Alien Three, Alien Resurrection, and Prometheus, uh, leading up to Alien Covenant. And uh, I'll. Alien Resurrection is garbage. I'll give you that. That's, uh, Alien Everyone's Res- right about that one. Everyone is right about Alien Resurrection. It's really bad. It's written by Joss Whedon, who is great. Uh, and there's like uh, oddly like Whedon-esque moments uh, every once in a while. But for the most part, uh, that movie does not work at all. And it gets super fucking weird, uh, which is normally something I like. Uh, and I think it is something you, you really got to watch to believe what happens at the end of Alien <laughs> Resurrection. Uh, all right. But uh, anyway, that's not really what I want to talk about. I want to talk about Alien 3. And I want to talk about Prometheus because I found myself really digging Alien 3 uh, upon this rewatch. Uh, and I, I did watch the assembly cut of Alien 3, uh, which is the much longer, uh, almost director's cut version of Alien 3. So David Fincher directed Alien 3. He's one of my favorite directors. Um, but the uh, the consensus around Alien 3 is that it was his first movie. Uh, and the production uh, was very troubled going into that one. Like, there was a lot of issues on set. There was a very, like, the studio was uh, breathing at Dave Fisher's back the entire time. Uh, and what ended up being released in theaters was a very truncated version of what Dave Fincher had originally envisioned. Uh, right. And so there's the assembly cut, which is on the Blu-ray, which I have, uh, which is about 40 minutes longer. It's the, the first time I had watched the assembly cut. Uh, and it... it locks in everything locks into place i feel like in this cut it's still it still has problems uh but it is a dirty like nasty self-contained really violent action thriller uh and i am was i was all in like i really dug alien 3 i think it is really interesting i think it has a really cool premise uh and it's totally its own thing uh so while it's a bummer that it kills off uh two fan favorite characters from aliens within the first five minutes uh off screen i should say (laughs) Uh, sounds familiar yeah Wait, what do you mean? Uh, we'll save it. <laughs> okay. Oh, okay. Yeah, I know what you're saying. I wouldn't, ca- I wouldn't call her a fan uh, favorite, but... Uh, <laughs> sure. Uh, but anyway, the, like, in Alien 3 kills off Hicks and Newt, um, which, right. you know, that happens uh, off screen in the first five minutes of the movie. Uh, and yeah, that is uh, kind of a bummer, but I feel like it builds on that very well, and like the movie that it uh, creates out of that... Uh, is really entertaining, and I love the premise of this movie, which has Ripley crash landing. Have you have you seen Alien Three? Uh, I think I have once, but I, I I had intended to do what to watch the whole thing, watch the whole franchise again. Uh, but I only made it through Alien and Aliens, okay. <laughs> which like, hey, I I think I won either way. That's fair. <laughs> uh, but at the at the end of Aliens, you know, Ripley and Newton Hicks go off in their ship and they're on their way back to Earth. Uh, right. and at the beginning of Alien 3, it's revealed that there was actually, uh, a xenomorph or a facehugger or whatever still on the ship, uh, and it, uh, destroys a couple of the pods, and the ship crash lands, and Hicks and Newt both, both die in the crash, and Ripley survives, uh, and she crash lands on this planet that's, like, this prison planet, uh, from way out in the outer reaches of space where, like, the hardest of hardened criminals go, and so the entire cast is made up of, like, these, uh, you know, these dirty, like, horrible, like, murderers and rapists and all that stuff. And, like, they're the worst of the worst. They're the suicide squad of <laughs> of alien protagonists. Uh, Do you mean that there were some kind of Aliens 3? <laughs> exactly. Uh, but I, I really love, like, there's just, like, this nihilistic nature uh, that this movie has. And Charles Dance is in this movie. He's, like, um, uh, you know, Ty- uh, Tywin Lannister on Game of Thrones. Uh, yeah. And Charles S. Dutton uh, is the, kind of, like, the ringleader of the prisoners, and he's great. And there's a lot of, like, really great dark comedy in the movie. There's one There's one bit where everybody's just, like, arguing and arguing with each other, and then the alien uh, pops <laughs> pops down from the ceiling and just grabs the dude that the guy's arguing with. And it's the prison warden, and the, <laughs> the alien pops out of the ceiling, grabs him, and, like, brings him up to the ceiling. And everybody just stares at it for a minute. And then the guy who's arguing with him is just like, Fuck! <laughs> <laughs> just it was the funniest f word i've ever <laughs> it, was, it was pretty great so uh, alien 3 uh highly recommend check out the assembly cut if you can because it is a it is a really solid movie and then uh, i did want to mention prometheus uh because that is a very divisive among alien fans uh yeah. you know that that movie came out and i remember liking it back when it was in theaters uh you know and i think you also liked prometheus right Mike? yeah yeah prometheus is one of those movies that i think every time i watch it i switch <laughs> um and like i i think that's a good thing i i guess right like yeah 
there it, it's an interesting movie to grapple with i yeah. guess i think i think it is kind of a mess of a movie but it's a, a really visually rich one like i think it's one of the best looking movies i've ever seen uh yeah. and it tackles a lot of really interesting thematic territory uh you know that's a movie that was written by damon lindelof uh, and I feel like a lot of the stuff in Prometheus is kind of a dry run for what he went, went on to do with the leftovers. Uh, yeah, like, that makes a lot of that all tracks. Uh, yeah. the, like the whole concepts of creation and stuff like that, I think is really interesting. Plus, I mean, that C section scene in Prometheus is aces. It's incredible. It's some of the best, yeah. some of the best like body horror of Ridley Scott's career. I think it's like up there with anything in the original Alien. It's pretty great. Uh, so yeah, I, I did want to mention uh, Prometheus is uh, still a, a very solid movie. It's not great, and I, I don't even know if I would say it's good. Uh, but I think it's really interesting, and I, right. it's, it's one that I would rewatch again at some point. Did you? Did you so you didn't get the chance to rewatch me this before Alien Covenant? No, I definitely really wish I did. Yeah, though. there's definitely probably should have. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, it's weird because this is. I mean, we'll talk about it in a minute, but it's not really like a direct sequel to Prometheus. It doesn't really have any of the same cast except for Michael Fassbender. Um, but it does build on a lot of the stuff that happened in Prometheus. Yeah, uh, and so I think that's uh, interesting. But we'll talk about all that right now, Mike. Uh, should we get into our review? Let's do it. All right, let's do that. Let's get into our review of Alien Covenant starting right now. Cyrus, <laughs> please, open up. I can't do this with anyone. Infection. <laughs> All right, that was from the trailer for Alien Covenant. And before we get into our review, Mike, there is some breaking film news happening on Twitter right now. Uh, hot off the presses? Hot off the presses. The presses are so hot, they are steaming, sir. <laughs> <laughs> That's not a phrase, right? <laughs> I mean, it could be. I mean, <laughs> uh, <laughs> Adam Wingard, the uh, director of such films as You're Next, The Guest, and uh, Blair Witch. He's uh, doing the uh, Death Note movie, which is coming out on Netflix uh, this year, too. Nice. Uh, one of my favorite directors working today. I really love his stuff, and uh, I'm very excited to see what he does next. And guess what? I know what he's doing next. <laughs> uh, is it Shrek 5? God damn it. No. <laughs> God damn. It is not Shrek 5. Uh, I mean, ideal in an ideal world, yes, Adam Wingard would be directing Shrek 5. <laughs> Imagine the the weird, creepy horror movie version of Shrek Five, directed, <laughs> directed by Adam Wingard. Yeah, no, that's uh, that's not happening. But what is happening is that Adam Wingard is going to be directing Godzilla vs Kong, Mike. Uh, so, which is which is insane. Yeah, that's really cool. <laughs> that is awesome. I, that is like he has not worked on a huge budget uh, ever. I don't think I, like, this is going to be a huge, uh, big step up for him as a director. Uh, in terms of blockbuster filmmaking, uh, and I am just super excited to see uh, this movie now. Like I, uh, I really love Godzilla, you know the Gareth yeah. Edwards movie. I was kind of lukewarm on Kong, but I, I basically liked it. You know, it was yeah. fun. Uh, I'm very excited about Godzilla too, which is going to be directed by Mike Doherty, who did Trick or Treat. Uh, and now this Godzilla vs Kong directed by Adam Wingard. So they're taking all my favorite indie horror directors yeah. and they're bringing them, <laughs> and they're bringing them to the uh, to the monster world. I'm very excited about this, man. This yeah. is awesome. Uh, That's really cool. Yeah, so we'll have uh, more on that story, I guess, next uh, episode if there's more to talk about other than just Adam Wingard's directing it. Uh, but until then, Mike, we should get into our review. Is that right? I think it's time. All right. So we are reviewing Alien Covenant today, the new film directed by Ridley Scott. It stars Michael Fassbender, Catherine Waterston, Billy Crudup, Danny McBride, Demian Bashir, Carmen Ijogo, and Amy Simetz, among others. And the IMG plot synopsis of the uh, Alien Covenant movie reads... The crew of a colony ship bound for a remote planet discover an uncharted paradise with a threat beyond their imagination and must attempt a harrowing escape. Ooh. Yeah, it's actually a pretty good plot synopsis from IMDb. I'll give them credit for that. Good one. job. Yeah, good job, IMDb. <laughs> yeah, so first of all, I think I mentioned this before, but it is really quite amazing that I was able to see a new Alien movie from Ridley Scott and new Twin Peaks from David Lynch this weekend. I think that is a yeah. <laughs> that is just a very nice thing for me. I'm very happy about that. <laughs> uh, so I said this uh, right before we started, but Alien Covenant builds on the ideas of Prometheus, uh, while at the same time, it also kind of feels like Ridley Scott is responding to how people reacted to Prometheus a little bit, right? Yeah. You know, Prometheus, yeah. Prometheus is a very non-traditional alien movie, I feel like. Like, alien... When Not you, even in the title. <laughs> this is very true. Uh, <laughs> you know, Prometheus is, is a more cerebral alien movie, I guess. Like, I feel like there is there is alien horror to be had uh, in that movie, but I feel like it's much more about uh, the exploration than anything yeah. else. And that's always been a factor in the alien movies, but I feel like Prometheus uh, lays that on much heavier. 
Uh, and it also introduces a lot of like really heavy thematic territory that the Alien movies have never really had up to that point. Yeah, from what I remember, um, when Prometheus was being promoted and stuff, that it was like not even being called an alien movie, right? If yes. I remember, it was like a spiritual successor thing. Yeah, I think orig- that, originally it was just going to be like, a, yeah, a different sci-fi movie. that happened. Yeah, just like set in that universe or something. Yeah, if it, I even maybe remember. not even that. It was just like a sci-fi movie that like Damon Lindolf was writing for Ridley Scott. And then halfway through, they were like, oh, we're like might we were sort of going to be an alien prequel but like maybe not and like everybody's yeah. like wait what like what's happening hey, huh excuse me <laughs> uh and so there was a lot of anticipation for me for prometheus going in because that was you know ridley scott returning to the alien universe like that was a huge yeah. deal uh and the movie that came out uh it's you know it's a mess it's a bit of a mess it's uh it got a pretty mixed reaction from fans online to say the least i feel like uh, there's a lot of negative chatter about Prometheus over the past five oh, years. Yeah. Uh, but I feel like that movie's reputation has grown at least a little bit uh, recently. I feel like I've seen more people coming out of the woodwork and being like, you know what? Prometheus actually uh, has some cool cool things happening in it. You know? I mean, that's me. Yeah. That's me. That's one voice. <laughs> I'm going to project that onto the whole internet. <laughs> Not the whole internet. Just a select uh, elite few. Right. <laughs> that are better than the rest. <laughs> Uh, so I, I do think, uh, this movie kind of responds to a lot of the, uh, complaints that people had with Prometheus, that that movie was, um, much more cerebral and less horror focused. And so Alien Covenant, I think, doubles down on, uh, being a movie that's more like Alien, uh, while also building on the themes of Prometheus. And I think it does that pretty well, uh, for the most yeah. part. I think, I think it's, um, it, it spends a lot less time on its, uh, thematic undertones than Prometheus does. But at the same time, I think it delivers uh, what it sets out to do. And I think it delivers a lot of really cool alien stuff happening and uh, good stuff. I, I mean, this has also been kind of a divisive movie uh, coming out of it. Uh, like, it's got, I think it's gotten slightly better reviews than Prometheus had. But uh, a lot of people are like, this movie sucks. Uh, it's, <laughs> uh, for, like, it's weird because it's divisive just like Prometheus was. Um, but it's divisive for, like, entirely different reasons. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah. I, th- I think uh... – Alien Covenant manages to do a bit of both. Um, like you were just saying, I'm not sure it manages to do both particularly well. Well, actually, that's not true. Um, I think the first half of this movie is a really awesome alien movie. Uh, okay. <laughs> yeah, I think there we, we have a return to creepy Ridley Scott horror stuff. Um, doing his alien thing, and then we veer off to do the Prometheus stuff, uh, which I have come around on a bit. So like I was saying, uh, kind of every time I view Prometheus, I bounce back and forth. And I think that this that Alien Covenant manages to. I, well, I guess what I'm trying to say is I'm interested in rewatching Prometheus after Alien Covenant to see if it elevates Prometheus in some weird way. Because I think I think. Alien Covenant manages to take some of those questions and ask them further, ask them different ways, come out, you know, take them to their next logical step. Uh, and I wonder how that translates to the original question, right? Um, I think it's asking a lot of really bold, intense, interesting things. Um, and I'm not particularly sure it gets to a satisfying answer just as far as a story arc would go, right, in a movie. Right. Um, but I still think that Ridley Scott in this movie being willing to go to that, like being willing to ask that question in this weird monster movie uh, um, is interesting. And I I definitely applaud it for that effort, even if it doesn't get all the way to where I would hope it would get to. That's that's actually really interesting because I was a lot more uh, enthralled with the second half of this movie than I was the first half. Uh, And it seems like you responded the opposite way. Yeah, well, I don't I don't want to come down on the second half of the movie. I just think it's such an interesting tonal shift. From the first half, uh, where craziness and fucking spines exploding, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, to hold on, we need to have a uh, discussion on uh, the human need to create, uh, <laughs> um, which is like it's awesome. I'm there for it. I'm there for that right, deep right. philosophical discussion. But it's just such an interesting difference, yeah, from did. the beginning of the movie. And that is interesting. I was actually listening to uh, the Slash Filmcast review of Alien Covenant, uh, and I don't want to parrot the things that said on, uh, were said on a different podcast. Uh, but I think it is interesting that uh, you know these are a lot of the themes that uh, are in Blade Runner, right? And <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> and so it's kind of weird that Ridley Scott is uh, transposing them onto the Alien movies as opposed to just making Blade Runner 2, which is right. happening. Like that's, <laughs> it's, it's, Without him. Yeah. Well, he's producing it, but that's that's a thing that's happening uh, that he could have directed if he wanted to. You know, if, Right. I, I think if, if they were making a Ridley, uh, new Blade Runner movie, I'm sure the first person they asked was Ridley Scott. You know? <laughs> right. You would hope so. Right. Uh, and so that's uh, really interesting there. And so I, I what, what I do kind of appreciate about these uh, Alien movies, Prometheus and Alien Covenant, is that there's very few movies made on this scale that tackle that, those kind of themes. Uh, yeah. And I think that's valuable uh, for them in any case. So I think that's that's really cool. I think that's kind of why I respond to the, these movies a little more than a lot of people do. Uh, and I do think this is a better movie than Prometheus is. Uh, I will say yes. that. Uh, I do think Prometheus is a more interesting one, if only because there's a lot of stuff to dissect in terms of uh, the flawed way it tells its story. And... <laughs> Uh, right and it, it like it's it's a flawed movie and i think it's one that's really interesting to unpack um but i think this one's uh, just better made and maybe even just be, it, maybe even because it's better made and because it gets the point across more clearly uh it's less interesting than prometheus is like it's a very weird dichotomy that i have in my yeah. head with these movies yeah that because prometheus is somewhat muddled and messy and you have to work through a lot yeah it it feels more interesting <laughs> <laughs> Which I mean, you're, you might not necessarily be wrong, right? There's a lot that that allows you to come at things from so many more different ways. I don't know if that's how you would fry. Right. <laughs> it's late. Uh, <laughs> uh, whereas a more straightforward discussion is is seems less interesting, right? Because yeah, <laughs> exactly. there's, there's less confusion. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I will say that Ridley Scott still one of the best visual filmmakers working. Like I I, I talked about Prometheus. That movie is one of the, like the best looking movies I've ever seen. Uh, and I, I don't yeah. think this movie has quite that same uh, level for me, but like I, I think the movies always look incredible, and this one looks a lot closer to the aesthetic of the original Alien, um, and you know that's part of the uh, idea. Like he wanted to get away from the kind of hyper polished environment of Prometheus and do something a little grungier and a little dirtier. Yeah, uh, and I think that uh, he accomplishes that here, and I think it looks really, really cool. Uh, I will say the characters feel a lot less distinctive than this than they could be. Uh, yes, and the the only ones that really stand out to me are uh, Catherine Watterson, Danny McBride, and Michael Fassbender, of course. Like Michael Fassbender, yeah. Uh, Michael Fassbender is it's actually unreal how good he is in this movie. I think he is like phenomenal. I mean, li- literally. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's true. But he, uh, I think he uh, he plays such a, a range of emotion within an emotionless character. Uh, yeah. so perfectly. And I think he's he's just perfect in these movies. And I would be okay if Ridley Scott just wants to make six David movies. Because uh, I think I think that's those are the movies that I think he really wants to make is are these movies yeah. focused on Michael Fassbender's David? Uh, yes. You know he, that's kind of what Prometheus was about, and this, that's kind of what this movie is about. And so I think he's way more interested in what's happening uh, with Fassbender's character than he is with anything else that's happening in these movies, including, which including uh, alien stuff. Like <laughs> yeah, yeah. Which, like you said, I hate to parrot the slash film cast, uh, but like that even begs the question even more. That Blade Runner is explicitly about androids <laughs> and humanity. Uh, yeah. And he picked the alien movies to do that in. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, th- I, think, I think it's mostly just circumstance the way the way yeah. it happened. Like, I'm sure, like, he was working on that. Like, we were talking about, like, Prometheus was kind of sort of an alien prequel for a while. It was on the fence. Uh, nobody right. really knew what it was. And so I think that was a different sci-fi movie that they ended up making into an alien movie. And uh, there, there was a whole lot of stuff going on there. Uh, and so I think, you know, the Blade Runner sequel was rumored for a long time, but finally just got off the ground recently. And so I think he just never got the opportunity to make it in a Blade Runner sequel, but yeah, you know, that's fine. You know, I, yeah, I, it's whatever. It's kind of what I like. I think if these were just straight alien movies, they might still be good. Um, but I think they wouldn't be as, as cool to talk about almost, uh, in that sense. Cause I, like, if you're just going to make a straight alien movie, there's no way it's going to be as good as alien or aliens, you know? So, yeah. It's like, <laughs> so yeah. It's, uh, and I think it is interesting, right? Just in, in terms of, the themes of Prometheus and Alien Covenant, and I don't, I don't think you can talk about one movie without talking about the other anymore, you know? Yeah. Or at least Alien Covenant without Prometheus. The theme of uh, what it means to create and what it means to make art, and is that the defining human characteristic, right? Uh, it's so interesting to think of Ridley Scott in a, in a man, uh, as a man in his later years coming back to the franchise he created to have this discussion, uh, which I think just makes it even all the more interesting. That makes Alien Covenant and Prometheus the questions that they're asking. Absolutely. I, uh, I, I really think Guy Pierce's character is like an analog for Ridley Scott. Like his, yeah. you know, Guy Pierce's character is uh, Peter Whelan, who's the creator of, the, of David, and he's 
uh, talking to, he, there's, he, they have a prologue scene at the beginning of this movie and they, uh, Guy Pierce appears in Prometheus as well, uh, mm. for, for like five minutes total in each movie. Um, yeah. but you know, he's, his whole thing is that he's, uh, contemplating the existence of creation and like he created David. So that sort of makes him David's God in a way. Yeah. Uh, and so he wants to know who created him and there's like the whole chain going on there. Uh, and I think that, uh, is, I, I think those are questions that really Scott is actually asking himself and like trying to fi- trying to figure it out through these movies. Right. Um, you know, those answers and look, those aren't questions that he'll ever fi- have answers to. Um, but it's really interesting to, uh, dive in and discuss them. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Definitely. The, uh, I so said the architects or engineers. I can't. I think I don't uh, remember. Engineers. engineers, engineers, right? If the engineers created the humans, created humanity in Prometheus, and then, or you know, whatever the not in the timeline, but we're you know, we're told that in Prometheus, and then humans create androids who destroy the humans who want to, the humans wanted to destroy the engineers. Like it's a whole weird. Your your creation will one day be more than you, and will yeah. destroy you. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean that prologue scene is weird uh, <laughs> and really intense but i was in i i love that kind of like deep philosophical yeah absolutely it reminds uh, me, one of my favorite exchanges in uh, prometheus um and i it's been a little while since you've seen it right so i might I need yeah to your memory there's a uh, the bit i think it's like halfway through the movie um david has poisoned uh a drink that he's right. giving to i think logan marshall green's character is the actor's name um and they're like there's talking they're having a discussion uh and, you know, Logan Marshall Green and Numir Pace, their whole thing is they want to meet the people who created them. They want to meet their makers. They want to meet their gods. Um, and so David comes up to them and he's like, why do you like, why do you want to be here? And Logan Marshall Green's like, we want to meet our makers and we want to find it. We want to know the question of why they created us. And David asks, well, why do you think they created me? And Logan Marshall Green's like, because we could. And uh, David's like, do you do you realize how disappointing that answer would be if you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah if you got that and that's and that like conversation like blows my mind that's such a deep philosophical thought uh that's in the middle of this you know space alien movie uh, yeah while like, he's poisoning drinks like <laughs> yeah <laughs> uh and so I, I think that that is that exchange is kind of at the heart of covenant as well uh and yeah. you know i think ridley scott has basically reinvented this franchise uh into like a meditation on life and creation rather than just being uh alien monster movies and yeah <laughs> And the Alien Monster movies are awesome. They're great. And, like, Alien and Aliens are better movies than Prometheus and Alien Covenant. I will say, right. <laughs> I will say that. But, but I, I think it's a weird, like, it, it feels unfair to even compare Prometheus and Alien Covenant to Alien and Aliens. They're, yeah. like, they're attempting two very different things. That's true. They're in the same franchise, but they are completely different uh, in terms of what they're going yeah. for. Uh, yeah. Like, Prometheus, I, Prometheus is kind of about discovering where we came from. And Alien Covenant is like more interested in what happens to us once we know that answer because they basically like they meet the guys who created them at the end of Prometheus, um, right? And so Alien Covenant, um, like the ending of Prometheus, ends on this sort of cliffhanger um, where Numir Pace and David uh, go off in their ship to go find the engineer's home planet, and that's where it ends. And right. then this movie takes place ten years later, and it kind of like lets you pick up a lot of the pieces from what happened uh, in between. I think there is an argument to be made that like the movie that happened in between these two movies is probably really good. And <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And I kind of wish we had seen a, at least a little bit of that. Cause there was a lot of this movie that was on the cutting room floor, I think. Um, yeah. and I, I mean, like there was like a lot of like, I mean, like it's, it's a movie that I basically like, I understood what was happening throughout the runtime. Uh, but there's a lot of supplemental, uh, features that came out with this. Like there's a prologue and there's like all this stuff, uh, that went online and there's like an extra scene with Numi Pace as her character from Prometheus. Uh, and all this stuff that went online and it's like, oh, this would have explained a lot of things in, <laughs> in yeah. Alien Covenant. I mean, it, it seems like that, that's like almost a franchise trait at this point. All the movies have a very, or not very long, but different longer director's cuts. Um, yes. <laughs> I think Aliens might not be that long, different time difference. I don't remember. Well, Al- Aliens, Alien has like a minute shorter director's cut actually. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. That was the one I was thinking of. Aliens, uh, the director's cut of that adds a bunch of stuff uh, dealing with Newt's family. Right, uh, and then Alien th- Alien Three, the director's cut, is superior to the original version. That's like the. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I guess the point I'm making is that it seems like there's always a ton of stuff that the director wanted to do for these movies. That uh, well, that's also that's different. also a, that's also a Ridley Scott thing. Like he's uh, somebody yeah. who 
uh, releases movies in theaters and then almost immediately comes out with a director's cut afterwards. There are like three or four different versions of Blade Runner, right? And the final cut yeah. is the, like the definitive version of that. Uh, Kingdom of Heaven, the director's cut, is like notably better than the actual movie. Uh, and you know, most of them don't need director's cuts. Like he's a director that I think – I think he basically has carte blanche to do whatever he wants in these movies. Uh, yeah. And you know, I, I, I don't see any kind of uncompromised vision happening here or something. Like I don't think the studio is giving him notes on how to make his no. alien movie or anything. Uh, but, you know, he is somebody who values the pacing of his movie and I think values the story uh, more so than maybe, like, character development or he sees certain details as extraneous and will cut them out of the movie if he feels he needs to in order to move the plot yeah. along. Uh, and that's to, to be said, like, this movie uh, starts off fairly slowly, right? It's it's a very – it's a yeah. kind of a slow burn for the first, like, half hour or so, much akin to the original Alien. Um, but even so, like, I feel like you, you lose a lot of parts. Like, I actually didn't realize this um, until it was pointed out to me afterwards, but in the trailer for this movie – it's mentioned that, uh, you know, they're a ship that's all couples, right? That's the right. well, it's a colonization mission. Uh, and I don't think they mentioned once in the actual movie itself that they are all couples. No. And that seems like a really important detail. <laughs> and yeah, it's, it's something I, you can basically gather. But it's yeah, just, it, I, it, it just seems like something you might have just wanted to throw out there at, like, at the beginning. Like, oh, yeah, this is the colonization mission that we're all couples and stuff like that. Like. <laughs> Yeah, it definitely was one of the things that I remembered one that during the the first 10 15 minutes when you know we're still kind of in this weird slow burn spaceship drama thing, right? right. That's going on uh, much like the beginning of the first alien. Um like you said. And I remembered that that line so like the emotional punch of what happens in the first three or four minutes of the movie, or after the prologue, I guess, yeah. made a lot more sense. And, like, you can kind of just gather that through context clues. But I was definitely like, oh, yeah, I remember that these they're all couple, they're all a couple. Like, everyone is couples. Yeah. <laughs> like, the crew. <laughs> um, even though they, didn't, they don't mention it. I mean, like, they eventually start mentioning, like, my, everyone mentions their wife or husband at some point. Right. But it's never explicitly said. Which, I guess, like you said, that... Uh, Ridley Scott felt that you would be able to, through context clues, figure that out. So yeah. cut that line out. We don't need it. Yep. <laughs> or cut that scene out or whatever. Pretty much what happened, yeah. So I feel like we've been talking about it for a little while at this point. Uh, we should probably get into spoilers for Alien Covenant. Am I right? Yeah. I, th I think it's interesting that this is also... We're talking about how, how much there is to discuss and the full, the full philosophical questions that this movie asks. It's like one of the longest times we've gone before we've gotten to spoilers. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> so let's let's do it yeah this is our, probably our longest non-marvel podcast uh yeah. <laughs> in quite a while and i even yeah. and those ones just like oh that was so cool that was so neat that was that so was cool. the best yeah. but uh yeah no this is uh i i really uh i really uh enjoyed alien covenant uh i don't think it's uh, a perfect movie uh i think it is uh messy in spots uh but i think it is a better movie than prometheus and i think it is a really interesting one uh yes. to discuss uh so let's move on to spoilers for alien covenant Starting right now. Stop it! Stop it! Stop it! Stop it! Stop it! You're spoiling me! You're spoiling everything! All right. Spoilers for Alien Covenant starting right now. So I just have a few things that uh, I did want to talk about uh, in this movie. Uh, the final twist uh, in which Walter turns out to actually be David. Uh, and yeah. then he places uh, – as he places uh, Waterston into hypersleep. I think it is so well played. I love I love that twist. I, I think it is a super obvious twist like from the get-go. Like I knew yeah. I knew that was going to happen. And that's something that I, I've saw people criticize uh, about the movie. And I don't think that's uh, a great criticism. I feel like Ridley Scott knows that you're going to know that that's happening. And I think that adds like this kind of tension to like the bat, like the last few scenes in the movie where there's like, oh, man, is he going to – is he going to betray them in some way or like what have you? Like, yeah. you, like, is he actually David? Is he actually Walter? Like that you have that in your mind. Uh, and so I think that's a really well played twist and it's, it's so inevitable that I thought it really, really worked. Uh, yeah. I mean, it, it's the, uh, like that, the Hitchcock quote, like if you show that there's a couple sitting at a table with a bomb beneath the table, it adds more tension if the audience knows what's going to happen. Yes. Um, so I was in like, it's pretty obvious. We don't, we don't see the conclusion of the, uh, I think is it Davindra or David Chen? I can't remember on slash film cast. Uh, put, causes it the Android Kung Fu fight, uh, <laughs> <laughs> the Android Kung Fu fight. Uh, uh, which yeah. was awesome, but you don't see the conclusion of it. So yeah. it's pretty obvious, but I was into it. Yeah. I yeah. thought it was cool. Speaking of that, man, I mean, fast bender versus fast bender. Dawn of fast benders was, <laughs> <laughs> Oh yeah, I'm in. Yeah. That like was... you said, I'm down for the six movie David, Covenant spinoffs. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I thought dope. that was I mean, cool. We, I feel like we haven't really actually mentioned this yet, but uh, Michael Fassbender plays a dual role in this movie. As a, yeah, I mean, I didn't know that. Is that in yeah. any of the trailers and stuff? Um, I don't. I don't, th I don't think that was revealed in any of the trailers. Yeah. Yeah. So, so that was uh, another point for being unsullied. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> that's that's. I think I think Walter was in the trailers. Like he was. Like he was. Yeah. In the trailers. I mean, I knew Michael Fassbender was in it, but I didn't know that it was 
both. Yes. So, uh, yeah, that was very cool. I think that was a very uh, cool reveal that there was two Fassbenders running around. I, I figured David would make an appearance after he showed up in the prologue. But, uh, yeah, that was uh, still very yeah. still very cool. And, uh, yeah, I, I really just enjoyed watching Fassbender play against himself. I think he does a fantastic job, again, in this movie. If there was any justice in the world, he would get an Oscar for, <laughs> for Alien Covenant. I think yeah. it would be insane. I, like, I would have watched a whole movie of Michael Fassbender playing the flute with himself for... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And then, and then making out with himself at one point. Uh, okay. Making out's a strong word, <laughs> strong, strong term for that. Uh, okay. Uh, okay, fair enough. But I, but I do think that those scenes are really fucking cool. Uh, just having no cuts as the camera slowly pans yeah. from David, David to Walter and back uh, while they're having this discussion was just a, a pretty cool technical feat. Uh, yeah, absolutely, and the way, the, the way, like the contrast between those two characters and the way, like Walter uh, is not the. Uh, evil menace that david is but even david's like yeah. not evil in the traditional sense he just has no um i guess what's the, he has no understanding of morality i guess he has no yeah uh like he has no perception of what that even means uh, he's he's too human right like he's yeah. he's so human it's uncomfortable yeah uh, as walter says he tells him that outright yeah so they, um, like, they almost like decrease the human dosage or whatever <laughs> i don't yeah the, the, i the think programming. They, Walter says that something along those lines that they made him less quirky, less idiosyncratic. Yeah. Uh, because that's part of what I feel like a lot of David's menace for the first half that he's in, I guess. So the first quarter or whatever, I don't know, whatever yeah. you however you want to break it down, uh, comes from just knowing what happened in Prometheus. Cause he's helpful. He's really, he's saving them. He's doing all the cool shit. Yeah. Uh, and he's not, he's not being creepy or scary yet. Um, yeah. Except for that one part where he poisons the guy's drink. I think is the uh... right. Well, I, no, no. I mean, in Alien Covenant, oh, yeah, the, yeah. the first the first part that he's in, he's not menacing. He's not creepy. In this movie, it, it, the context of Prometheus makes him scarier. Right, right, right. Yeah, I guess is what I'm saying. Yeah, I see what you're saying. Yeah, and I, and that's the thing. Like in Prometheus, like he's it, like we're saying he's too human. Like in Prometheus, he's established as like enjoying art and like doing all these kind of right. things. There's a a bit in the mo- at the beginning of that movie which I love where he's watching Lawrence of Arabia. Uh, and right. he's like watching it and he's, and then right after you see him watching it, he's like styling his hair after, uh, the main character in the movie, Peter O'Toole's character. Uh, and so I think that's a, a very, like, I, I, I think there's a lot of really great character stuff with David. He's an incredible character. And, uh, I think the reveal yeah. in this movie that he murdered, uh, Numir Pace, uh, as Shaw, uh, which yeah. is what you were referring to before when I was talking about Alien 3. Uh, yeah, that and uh, James Franco was the first thing I thought of, but that happens on screen. Okay, well, I mean, I guess, but James, James Franco was also not in Prometheus or anything. He wasn't a fan favorite character. No, he no, just, no. Yeah, he, that, that struck me as like, oh, it's a cameo of James Franco, and he dies. Like, <laughs> <laughs> which is hilarious. That, I mean, that's like, I got to know what the director's cut of that is. Yeah. Is why would they? Why is that James Franco? I believe he's in the prologue of the movie, like the one that went online. Oh, uh, that uh, makes sense. So that might be it. And apparently, Numir Pace also shot a scene. Uh, that went online too. Now that I, I do remember that happening in Prometheus also for the promotional stuff that yeah. them fil- putting out the auditions, quote unquote, I think of their characters trying interviewing to be on the ship of Prome- in Prometheus. Okay. Yeah. I remember that. I remember there was a promotional, some video. weird viral promotional stuff. Yeah. There was a lot of viral stuff from Prometheus. I think this, this is actually legit, like actual scenes for <laughs> that could have been in the movie that uh, they s- decided not to be, but uh, yeah, really, Really odd stuff there, but uh, yeah, that, the reveal that he did murder Shaw just shows like it's, it's such an effective like cold blooded scene. It kind yeah. of shows the ruthlessness of David, uh, even though he's not a ruthless guy. Like he's just uh, you know he's uh, he's David. He's, he's just... Yeah, yeah, it, it's it's so interesting to see him, uh, David, pursuing the most like I, I think I said earlier that like the most human drive to create, uh, whether it be art or life in, in form of children, like whatever it might be. Uh, create and he but he comes at it from the cold heartless emotionless mechanical sense yes. um, where he doesn't get the impact of the things he's doing just you know but it, the ends justify the means kind of thing right yeah, yeah absolutely and uh yeah i did want to mention some of the uh the great set pieces in this movie because uh, there are a few that i really really enjoyed uh, specifically i think my favorite uh sequence in this movie is when Danny McBride picks up Catherine Waterston, Demian Bashir, and Fassbender up in that small ship, and the alien starts attacking. Um, because yeah, that, that was like, like that was a really great scene. The use of the crane in that scene is a total like, oh shit moment. Yeah, it is. It is awesome. It's a really cool, effective action scene. Yeah, I, I think uh, also like a shout out to just the Alien franchise as a whole. 
uh, with their badass female action heroes uh, yeah, <laughs> for the true. last 30 years. That's true. It's um, Ripley and then uh, New Mirror Face and now Catherine Waterston. Yeah, I think Catherine Waterston gets a little less to do. I don't remember New Mirror Face a whole, uh, as an action hero specifically, but that yeah, movie isn't very much of an action movie, right? But yeah. she's still the protagonist of that movie. But I feel like Catherine Waterston is definitely um, Daniels is definitely uh, set up to be like a new Ripley kind of thing. Like in terms of she's fairly capable, more much more capable than everyone else on the crew, at least. I could see that, <laughs> could see that. if these movies weren't specifically about David and <laughs> yeah, were, oh were yeah, in, right. were instead about the human characters, I could see her popping up in the next movie. I I right. don't think that'll. I, I think it will be another thing where it's going to be like ten years in the future and like it's going to be about David doing some other crazy shit. Like yeah, if, absolutely. If there's, if there's another one, I don't. I don't think this movie did that well. Um, and I don't think Prometheus did that well either. And this movie happened anyway. So, uh, yeah. yeah, I think it's just Ridley Scott going to do what Ridley Scott going to do. I guess uh. so. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, and I, I, so that, that was a great set piece. Uh, and also the set piece right after that, when the uh, alien bursts out of Demi and Bashir and, uh, Catherine Marston and, uh, Danny McBride have to eject it with Fassbender's help. And that's, that's the sequence where it's like, you don't know if that's David or Walter. Um, yeah. Because like that, that fight has already happened between the two Fassbenders. Uh, right. And so you like, is he going to like betray them? Is he going to like send them down the wrong hallway or something? Because they're like entirely dependent on what he's doing in that scene. Uh, and I think mean, that was really yeah. cool. And then they end up, you know, throwing the alien at the airlock, and it's awesome, and it's it's pretty neat. It's also straight out of Alien and Aliens. Yeah, and absolutely, fucking I mean, they've, awesome. They've, they've pulled the airlock thing a few times in this range. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they love shooting shit out into space. Absolutely. Uh, but yeah, the, the thing that this movie does kind of fall flat on is a lot of the character work, which again, I liked, I, I liked Catherine Waterston and Danny McBride quite a bit and Fastbender is aces. Uh, but then there was like that final set piece with Demi and Bashir. I was surprised that, uh, Demi and Bashir was in that final set piece, um, because I didn't realize he was still alive. Like I, <laughs> I thought the character had died. I was surprised yeah. he made it as long as he, cause he, his inclusion at the end is like, oh, he, like, if he's going to be at the end of this movie, he should have had more things to do throughout the movie. So I, I kind of care about yeah. him a little bit. Uh, and then there's a lot of like other characters who just like do. Like, it's kind of the same complaint that people have with Prometheus. Like these characters do stupid things all the time, <laughs> you know. Uh, yeah. And that yeah. uh, that in turn causes them to die at the hands of the alien, and that that isn't great. Uh, but the alien, like the alien attacks, are cool. Uh, there's like the one sequence yeah. where um, they're in the med bay, and the one scientist, I think it's Danny McBride's wife. Uh, Amy, I think it's Amy Simetz. On the rover, on the planet, or yeah. in the ship? At on, the, the, on the planet in the med bay, right? Uh, yes. When the alien, the alien comes, or the two people come in, and the alien bursts out of one of the guys, and the late she starts freaking out and le- runs away from the med bay and locks the other person in the, <laughs> in yes. the door, and then she runs back with like an axe or something, and then like they all die, and it's like, oh, that's uh, this is weird, like what? <laughs> I mean, I enjoyed the sequence. I thought it was a lot of fun to watch, but like it was, it was a lot of like substitute. Like she's, they're, they're supposed to be relatively smart characters, right? These are like scientists and like people. Uh, I mean, I know they're colonists this time around, so maybe it's not as smart as they should have been in Prometheus. Uh, but at the same time, yeah. at the same time, there's like basic common sense kind of things that. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I was like, a small, I, I mean, I, I, yeah, I mean, it makes sense. I felt that one that that character locking the other people in the med bay. Uh, seemed like a rational. I mean, rational is not the right word. It, like a, a logical choice in an irrational situation, right? Like okay. there's some weird shit. Quarantine them in the med bay. I need to fucking get the shotgun or whatever she right. goes for. Uh, so like I bought that. Uh, but yeah, there's definitely you know uh, Billy Crudup looking in the egg, <laughs> like putting his face <laughs> in the egg. That was almost <laughs> as bad as the guy in Prometheus like poking the thing with his finger, like that. Yeah, which they do again in this one yeah. when there's that weird fucking. <laughs> Hushtool thing on the ground. Yeah. Um, but I think that sequence, that whole, um, from the moment they start to investigate the ship uh, on the the planet to when the th- rover fucking explodes, uh, <laughs> was really intense. Uh, yeah, I thought I like that whole the people running from a, a bad situation to a worse situation that they don't know about right. <laughs> was really intense. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, that, I like that stuff. That part was that was probably my favorite set piece, yeah. action wise. Yeah, a lot of good, a lot of good stuff in Alien Covenant. Uh, I gotta say, I feel like we've talked about this a long time yeah. at this point. So we should probably try to wrap it up. But uh, do you have any final thoughts about Alien Covenant, Mike? Um, I think, like I said before, it's a really cool. It has really cool uh, action horror stuff. We have a, a nice throwback, a nice return to that for a while, uh, and then we get some really deep philosophical, interesting 
meditations on creation and art and what it means to be sentient in some weird way, right? Um, the desire to make things. Uh, and I, and even if it doesn't get to the an answer, which I don't really know if you could with that kind of question, no, uh, I applaud yeah. its effort for going there. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I'm in the same boat. I really enjoyed Alien Covenant. I think it's a little bit better than Prometheus. Uh, you know, it's not, it doesn't reach the heights of the Alien franchise, but it, go, it takes it to a lot of really interesting places uh, that I really enjoy talking about. So uh, that yes. is our review of Alien Covenant. Uh, Mike, where can we find you online this week? You can find me at twitter.com slash mdfilmblog. Uh, and if you like Dungeons and Dragons, my friends and I post our games at youtube.com slash geonerd79. And you can find me online at twitter.com slash msmithfilmblog and all of our podcasts and stuff at filmbook.com. Plus, I do some work at crookedscoreboard.com. You can check me out there. Thanks so much for listening to Filmbookcast. I'm Mike Smith. That is Mike DiCrescio. If you're listening to this review via our podcast on iTunes, you can subscribe to the podcast, rate it, and take a moment to give us a review. Any and all feedback, compliments, topic discussions, and even hate mail can be sent directly to podcast at filmbook.com. Please list the podcast you're emailing about in the title of your email because we produce just so many different ones hard to keep track. We would love to hear from you. Join us in two weeks for the next film bookcast where we'll probably be reviewing Wonder Woman. Pretty uh, excited about that one, Mike. I've heard good things, uh, which is cool. The DC slump may finally uh, <laughs> may finally be over. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Wonder Woman going to put the team on her back and just save the day. Yeah, hopefully. And then you can check out our next Complete Works, where we're going to be talking Nicolas Cage's directorial debut, 2002's Sunny, which we've been advertising for quite a long time at this point. But this this one, this time, <laughs> this time it'll actually happen, <laughs> we hope. Yeah, uh, in theory. 2002 Sunny, which stars uh, Alien Covenant star James Franco. Uh, <laughs> uh, star, strong word. <laughs> Alien Covenant featured player James Franco. There you go. Uh, thanks so much for listening, guys. We are out. Baby, my heart's on fire. If you refuse me, honey, you lose me. Then you'll be left alone. Oh, baby, telephone and tell me I'm your own. Check, please.